So um, let me uh, pray for you guys. Jesus, Father God, we give you glory in all things. We thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us. We thank you so much for the mothers you've given us that uh, they're just there to love us and support us. Lord, we thank you just for your word. And we ask that your Holy Spirit go forth this morning. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I do not have a Mother's Day sermon for you guys. Sorry, the Lord had laid something else on my heart uh, that I wish to share with you guys today. So are y'all down with that? Cool, because I was going to do it anyway. Um, so I wanted to do something a little bit different this morning. Um, so it's not too crazy different, so don't get nervous. But what I wanted to do is look at the life of three different New Testament characters, some of whom are a little bit obscure, not, not as popular. And I wanted to look at the background of their life and take a look at how Jesus came into their life. Um, how um, they come together. So these are three different uh, Bible characters, and we're going to look at their life and um, talk about that. Um, so also, I um, am a visual learner. So I did something this morning. I have graphics for you guys um, because I, uh, I learn things when I, when I can see them. So I'm going to have a couple different graphics for you guys so you can connect the biblical characters with an image. I want to preface that there are not photographs of these people or like still paintings. These are not what they actually look like, but they helped me. So I figured that they might help you guys, um, get and, and keep track of who's who. So turn to your Bibles real quick, uh, to Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 50 and 51, and we'll start there. Um, So it says this, Luke chapter 23, verse 50, says this, Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decisions and the actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So our first person is Joseph of Arimathea. So we have a graphic. Or is it? Yes. Awesome. So this is our graphic of Joseph of Arimathea. I just want to take a step back and just be like, I don't know who painted this. I'm not like an art historian or anything, but I love this picture. Like apparently Joseph was not just uh, waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Apparently he was super strong and just took Jesus under his arm. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but a uh, shout out to Mikey Polino for uh, creating these graphics for me. Um, this is hopefully it'll help you guys because it definitely helped me. So Joseph of Arimathea, as many of you guys know, he was the one that provided the tomb for Jesus after he had passed away. So just from these verses, we, got, we get a couple things. He was a member of the Jewish High Council. Um, that's also known as the Sanhedrin. So I promise you, I'm not going to bore you with all these crazy long biblical terms, but there are some things that you have to know. The Sanhedrin was the absolute like high uh, ruling um, class from uh, in those Jewish times. So in other words, like the, the equivalent is it's kind of like our Supreme Court, right? So you, they governed the Jewish people in those Roman um, times. There was, there was Roman government, and then they governed the Jewish people. And that consisted, the Sanhedrin consisted of Pharisees and Sadducees. We won't, we'll talk about them a little bit later. But so Joseph was a prominent man that was part of that high council. It was a, it was a great honor. Um, and it says he had not agreed with the decision And he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So I don't know. There's not too much about Joseph in the Bible. But if this was all that's written, I think that's a great thing, right? He was a righteous man and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Um, So uh, real quick, the Bible also says that he was a rich man. He was prominent. He had money and he was on that high council. Uh, One more verse that I want to read about Joseph is John chapter 19, verse 38. It's John chapter 19, verse 38. It says, Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, parentheses, because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, 
Joseph came and took the body away. So it's very interesting here that Joseph is considered a secret disciple. It makes that clarification. It qualifies. He, Joseph of Arimathea, that's where he was from, the town he was from, kind of like saying Jesus of Nazareth, he was a secret disciple. Why? Because he feared the Jews. And it's very interesting to, to look at that and be like, what, what did he fear? Joseph was Jewish himself. Why would he fear his own peers? Why would he fear the people that he worked closely with every single day? So it says he was a secret disciple and he was fearful. So this matters. So if y'all are taking notes, you could write Joseph of Arimathea, boom, was a secret disciple. Can everybody say secret disciple? Yes, y'all are awesome. So Joseph was a secret disciple because he was fearful, because inside him there was a great fear. Now, people are normally fearful when? When they have something out of their control, when they cannot control something. And Joseph, given his prominence and his high standing and the fact that he was wealthy, was scared because Joseph had a lot to lose. He was secret because if anybody found out he was a disciple, he could lose everything that he had, everything that he had worked for in his life, his prominent standing. If somebody found out, he would be thought of differently and he could potentially lose all of it. And so as we talk about the background of Joseph, I believe that among us here, there are secret disciples. There are people sitting here that you proclaim Jesus on Sunday and throughout your week, nobody knows it. And it comes from a place of fear because if someone found out, then they would treat you differently or you would be thought of differently. And that's where Joseph's fear came from. And honestly, I don't blame him. I think I would do the same in that situation. Oftentimes in my younger days, I was afraid of the same thing because of my deep insecurities. People would be like, hey, Yuri, what are you doing on Sunday? Well, you know, just hanging out. When I was in church, but I was afraid because I didn't want to be thought of differently. And so Joseph comes from a very, very re relatable place. We can understand exactly where he's coming from. So let's move on. Just, just remember, Joseph was a secret disciple. And so we'll move on to my second person. And let's turn into our Bibles to John chapter 3. And we'll start in verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. And it says this. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious teacher who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. We'll stop there for a second. We'll read one more verse in a second. So Nicodemus to me is very interesting because he was on the Sanhedrin with Joseph. Um, but it also says he was a Pharisee. So we'll get to what that means in a second. But Nicodemus, he was also very high up and very prominent. Um, and so um, he had seen what Jesus was doing. Obviously, he sees these miraculous signs and he starts to get curious. His whole life, he's known one way. It's about the law. It's about the Old Testament. It's about keeping 613 laws. The Pharisees were the most religious people of all. Think of someone that you know that's just like a Boy Scout and just, just, just like keeps all the rules to a T and you're just like, man, they got their life kind of figured out. Well, Nicodemus lived his life in a way where he had 613 rules that were given in the Old Testament that he tried to live his life by to a T. And I believe it came from good intentions. I believe that Nicodemus thought, I'm doing right. This is the Old Testament. I, this is how I gain my salvation. But Jesus came on the scene and he got curious. And so I don't know how they set up this meeting. There was no like text messages or like or, or like, you know, Facebook invite, but he got to meet with Jesus. And so he comes in the middle of the night. And so I don't know exactly how that happened. Did they have a pre-agreed upon meeting place or did they meet at somebody's house or like, did they just come and was like, Jesus, are you there? And he was like, yes, Nicodemus. Okay, let's talk. Like, I don't know if that's what happened, but he comes in the middle of the night. So I'm, I'm, sur I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, it, it, was, it was pretty quiet and he comes in the middle of the night. Why? Because Nicodemus, he did not want to be seen. 
He didn't want anybody to see him. Why? Because of the same reason as Joseph, because he was afraid. Afraid of the same thing because of his prominent standing and who he was. He was afraid that somebody would see him and he would be exposed. There are some of us here that don't want to be seen. For whatever reason, sometimes in our lives, we do not want to be seen because of, of sin in our lives, because of just, just how we're living our lives. Sometimes we are afraid to be seen, and it is a normal reaction. We can also relate to Nicodemus, and he comes to Jesus. And I love this because Nicodemus knew his Bible backwards and forwards. So I guarantee you that like Nicodemus kind of prepared this before. He was like, Jesus is going to come, and I'm going to give him this speech, right? Rabbi. We know that you are a, t- a teacher and you have performed miraculous. So he's, he's, he's prepared, like he prepares this whole speech to give Jesus. He's like, hey, like I know who you are. What, what can you tell me? And I don't, I'm not necessarily sure what Nicodemus was looking for. Potentially he was looking for Jesus to verify him. Hey, Nicodemus, doing pretty good. Yeah, Jesus. Thanks, teacher. That's perhaps what he was looking for. And so he comes and he prepares this speech and he goes, and he goes, Jesus, uh, we know that God has sent you because of these miraculous signs. And this is what I love about Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't really, he he has different responses to different people that he interacted with, right? When, when, to the woman at the well, he was kind and gentle to her. Nicodemus should have known better. So Nicodemus prepares the speech. He gives it to Jesus and Jesus goes in right away. Verse three says this, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes right in. Nicodemus is like, hey, what can you tell me? You must be born again. And it's interesting, we're not going to read all the verses. Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't understand at all. He's like, what do you mean, Jesus? Like, how am I supposed to be born again? Like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And Jesus goes on and he tries to explain to him and he gives Old Testament stories and he's explaining to Nicodemus like what it means to really know Jesus. And Nicodemus is like, well, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. And it's interesting because I, in my personal opinion, this is some of Jesus' like best teaching, right? John 3, 16, the most popular verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life was said to Nicodemus, right? Jesus is in the middle of the night, pitch darkness. I don't know if they had a torch. And he's talking to Nicodemus and he's, and he's telling him what he needs to do And Nicodemus doesn't get it. And so Nicodemus is fearful as well. And Jesus talks to him and he doesn't get it. And if you go to the end of this interaction, nothing happens. Right? Oftentimes we expect Jesus and he gives his whole sermon. And we expect Nicodemus to be like, oh, Jesus, you are right. Oh, you are right, and because he he's done it times and time before. But the chapter, it just ends. He has this whole dialogue. Jesus is telling him, and then it, they just go on forward, and we don't see any kind of change in Nicodemus's life. And it's very interesting that, that that's what happens. Um, so Nicodemus came in the night, was fearful, had an interaction with Jesus, and as far as we know, nothing happened. And so We'll move forward. Um, This is written in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 2. It says this. Along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. We'll stop there. So Mary Magdalene... Uh, she's, she's a little bit more popular. She was a woman who at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus had cast out seven demons. So in other words, Mary's life was wrecked by Jesus from the very beginning. From the very beginning, he came in and changed her life completely. And since then, Mary followed Jesus with everything that she had. And so um, verse 3 The end of verse 3 says this, And many others 
Mary and many others were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So Mary was pretty rich too. She had money to support Jesus as well. And from the very beginning, she was a disciple. She was all in. Jesus wrecked her life, and um, she, she was the one that washed Jesus' feet and anointed him. And so her whole life was, was, was all about Jesus. He changed my life. He wrecked me, so I'm going to follow him. And so here we have three distinct characters that somehow come together. Joseph was, he was a disciple, but it was in secret because of fear. Nicodemus didn't know what he thought. He had an encounter with Jesus and was fearful as well. And Mary Magdalene, her whole life was about Jesus. And so this is the walk that they all walked. And that's what their life was like. And let me tell you, all of them, Joseph and Nicodemus and Mary, they had a lot to lose. Right? Joseph and Nicodemus were both rich and they both had high standing and they both were well respected in their communities and people saw them and knew their name was like, oh shoot, that's Nicodemus. And that's why he came in the middle of the night and that's why Joseph was in secret because of those reasons. They had a lot to lose. And so that's the way they lived their lives and they were cool with it. And so let's turn to our Bibles to John Chapter 19, starting in verse 38. And it says this, verse 38 says this. John chapter 19, verse 38. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. Verse 39, this is absolutely, it's cool. It's cool and mind-blowing for me the first time I saw this. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and alloys. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus here. Here's what I want you to understand, is that Joseph and Nicodemus came to take Jesus down from the cross. And this is absolutely profound, and I'm going to explain it to you right now. Understand what we know about Joseph's secret disciple. Nicodemus doesn't know what he thinks about Jesus. So that weekend, that Friday night, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And the Sanhedrin, which Nicodemus and Joseph were both a part of, were the group that condemned Jesus to the cross. And if we look, it says Joseph did not agree with them. And Nicodemus, um, when uh, it, there's a verse in there that says, um, this says, is it legal to convict a man before he's given a hearing? That's in John uh, 7. Nicodemus pipes up and all he says, is it legal to put a man? And so these men at this time when Jesus is being put to death, they're still in their secrecy. They're still in their fear because you know what? They're scared. That makes sense to me, right? They're scared and Jesus is being put on trial and they don't know what's happening. And all of Jerusalem is witnessing Jesus being uh, put on trial. And Joseph is there and Nicodemus is there and Mary Magdalene is, in the, is also there watching all this happen. And all three of these people witness Jesus Christ being beat with an inch of his life. And then they see nails being put in his hands and they see crowds of people screaming at him, crucify him. And they sit there and nothing happens. But then the next day they get up and they want to see what happened to Jesus. And so Joseph and Nicodemus, I want you guys to understand how radical of a change this is. These men that were so fearful because they had so much to lose, because Jesus was pierced, something changed in them, and I think they came to a realization that, oh snap, Jesus means more to me than any of this. And he died for me, and he was pierced, and so they wake up, and Joseph goes. He doesn't send a servant. Joseph was rich, and he goes to Pilate. He goes to Pilate and he comes up to him and he says, Pilate, 
Can I have the body of Jesus? And here's what I want you guys to understand. When a person was crucified in Roman times, their body was effectively Roman property. And what would happen is after someone was crucified, their body would either decay on the cross or wild animals would come and tear it apart. And then they would take the bones and throw them in a pit. But no, not for Joseph and not for Nicodemus. They came bold. Understand the boldness. They come in front of everyone. And they say, and, and he comes to Pilate, the same one where they said, crucify him. And he says to them, I want the body of Jesus. And he goes himself and he brings a ladder or something to take his savior down from the cross in full view of anybody that walked by that day. And Nicodemus, the same one that came in pitch darkness, he comes to with 70 pounds of spices because he wanted to give Jesus a proper burial. And here's what I want you guys to understand is that fear did not matter anymore. All their standing, everything that they knew and that they had built up did not matter anymore. And here's why. Because they realized that Jesus meant more to them than any of that stuff previously. Yes, if you, if you believe that, give him praise. And so they come and they take his body down and they wrap him and Joseph takes and he uses his personal tomb, the tomb that he had built for himself. He said, you know what? I'm going to put my savior there. And the radical change for them was the fact that Jesus died. And I want you guys to understand is that he died not just for Joseph, not just for Nicodemus, not just for Mary Magdalene, but for all of us here today. And he deserves a response. He deserves us to go to him just as Joseph did, just as Nicodemus did, and say, you know what? I don't care what people think. I don't care what they may say. I don't care about everything that, that I have worldly. I care about you, Jesus. And that's what they did. And that's an absolutely profound moment. And I believe that there are some of us here today that are secret disciples. I believe that we're fearful of what people might think. I believe that there are some people here that may have had an encounter with Jesus. You've, you've, you've seen him. He's spoken to you, but you have not come to him like Nicodemus did. These three people came from different walks of life. Mary was completely head over heels for Jesus. Joseph was in secret and Nicodemus didn't know. But because he died, they came. And so there's two things, or there's one more thing about, jo about, about Joseph and Nicodemus. Joseph and Nicodemus were religious teachers. Their whole life, since they were young, they studied the Torah they studied the law and they knew it better than anyone. I want to, Nicodemus had sections of the Jewish Old Testament memorized and he did his best to live that way. Why? Because he believed and Joseph believed that this law would save them. They believe that if I do this, that is where I gain salvation. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, that the law could not save them. And some of us here today are living in the law. We're stuck on a sin and we're trying as best as we can to break free from it. We're stuck on a certain way of living and we're trying to break free of it with our own power. And that's what Joseph and Nicodemus did. They said, you know what? Because of all these laws, we can do it. Romans 8 says, the law was given to us to make our sin known, to make us known that we are sinful, but the law could not save us. Right? For Jesus did not come to abolish or destroy the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. The fulfillment of the law, what could save them was not the law. What could save them was Jesus Christ. And that's what they broke free from. They broke free from the fact that all these rules and regulations and look toward Jesus that was crucified. I want to give you a little bit of example of that if you're not clear. This analogy um, about how the law cannot save us. Say you went to the beach and you saw a large body of water that, that had deep waters. And there was a sign that said, do not swim deep waters. And you see this sign and this sign makes you know, makes you aware that there is danger here, that there is sin here. 
But if you yourself decide to go into those waters, then that sign will not save you. Then that law will not save you. But if you go into that water and you're drowning, then Jesus can save you. That sign won't save you, but Jesus will save you. The law cannot save, but Jesus can save. Jesus did not come to abolish or destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And Joseph and Nicodemus, when they came that morning, they said, the law doesn't matter. My standing doesn't matter. My riches don't matter. You matter. The title of this message is, what are you willing to lose? What are you willing to lose? So Nicodemus and Joseph were willing to give up all that they had gained for the sake of just giving Jesus a proper burial. They came because he died. And Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 25, says this, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for the sake of Jesus will save it. This is the realization that Joseph, Nicodemus, and Mary came to because Jesus died on that cross. Because they came to that realization. And so the next morning, the next morning, Mary Magdalene, who her whole life had been all about Jesus and had been all about funding his ministry. And she was there through it all. Imagine that Saturday, her savior died and all the disciples and Mary and all of them forgot that he said, Hey, I will rise again. And so imagine Mary Magdalene and the state she's in everything that she staked her life on is gone. Jesus died. And if we look at the other 12 disciples, I don't blame them, but they all were cowering in fear and they all ran away. And we read that some of them returned to their past lives because, hey, everything we've done for three years doesn't matter anymore because Jesus is dead. Man, I guess we were wrong. And so imagine the state of Mary Magdalene that Friday and Saturday, everything she knew was gone and she was in a deep state of despair and sorrow. And what do I do next? Because everything I put my life on is gone. And I believe that there are people here today, you know Jesus, you've experienced Jesus. He is your Lord and Savior, but something came into your life, some, some troubles or iniquity or, or something that's just hard because life is hard. And now you're distraught and there is despair and you don't know what to do. Just like Mary, you're sitting there and you're just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So Mary wakes up on Sunday, distraught and full of sorrow. And she goes, you know what? I'm going to go make sure my Savior was buried correctly. I'm going to go make sure everything there on Sunday. And so she goes. And so she wakes up and she goes to the tomb and uh, this is written in John chapter 20, verse 11. It says, Mary was standing outside of the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stepped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. And so Mary comes to the place distraught and not knowing what to do. All of us come from different backgrounds. Some of us here are in where Joseph was. Some of us here are where Nicodemus was. And some of us are here like Mary. And as the band helps me close, Mary was looking inside the tomb and she was looking for, for Jesus. And she was looking, where is my savior? And she runs back to the disciples and she's like, hey, he, he's not there. He's not there. And so they go and they have their own experience. And Mary is there. And she looks for him and she sees a gardener and she thinks, she thinks that it's a gardener and she, she, she goes to him and she says, where, where have they placed Jesus? You can almost hear as you read, you can almost hear it in her voice, the, the, the cry out, where, where, where is he? 
My Savior's not here. Have they stolen him? And Jesus turns to her, and all he says, he says, Mary. And she says, she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. And she looks at him, and, and verse 18, that says, Mary found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And she gave them this message, Mary, because even in her despair, even in her uncertainty of what happened to her Savior, she still believed, and she was there searching for Jesus. Just as Joseph and Nicodemus came on the, that Saturday to take Jesus down, or that Friday night to take Jesus down from the cross, Mary came searching for Jesus too. And so all these people come from different places and different experiences. Joseph was a secret disciple, and when he looked at his walk with Jesus, he didn't understand why it was worth giving his whole self to Jesus until he saw that Jesus died and understood that it was for him. And so he came to Jesus. Nicodemus didn't know where he stood with Jesus at all. He met him and talked to him and experienced him, but he didn't know who, where he stood with Jesus until Jesus died. Until Jesus died, he didn't understand that he died for him. And Mary saw Jesus die and didn't understand that Jesus was still there for her. And so all these people, Joseph, Nicodemus, and Mary, we know that they made the right choice because Jesus rose again. Because they put their faith, when Jesus died, they came, and the next day they made the right choice because Jesus was alive. Jesus lived again. And if you're thankful, you ought to give him praise because Jesus lives today. And so, I want you all to understand today that wherever you are in your walk, whether you're Joseph Mary or Nicodemus, wherever you are, Jesus died for you too. He died for you too. And he is wanting the same kind of response. He wants you to say, hey, Jesus, you died for me, for my sins, for my transgressions. So all of me, everything that I have that's worldly, all my possessions, everything that I've gained here on earth is for nothing. I die myself to you. And I tell you, there's not been one person that ever regretted that decision because Jesus rose again. I've never met a person that said, man, I regret following Jesus. Everyone, just as those three knew they made the right choice because Jesus lives again. And he is calling you to himself. He is saying the same thing he said to Nicodemus and Joseph, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. And so it begs a response. The word of the Lord cannot return void. Jesus' death and resurrection requires a response. And if you are here today and you don't know where you stand with Jesus, brother or sister, I beg and I plead with you, do not leave this place not knowing him, not saying, Jesus, you died and I love you. And I will take your body down from the cross. I will serve you. I will be your servant because you rose again. And I guarantee you with everything I know, with everything that's written in here, you will not regret your decision. So just as Joseph, just as Mary, just as Nicodemus, these altars are open. And wherever your walk is, come. Come to the altar. Come to where Jesus is. Jesus, we love you. We give you glory. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for resurrecting so that we can die to ourselves and have life in you. And brothers and sisters, these altars are open.